हेलो एवरीवन, आई एम डॉक्टर स्वप्निल भालेकर अ कॉनेक सर्जन एट विजन केयर सेंटर सुपर स्पेशलिटी आई हॉस्पिटल शिरूर डिस्ट्रिक्ट पुणे इन दिस वीडियो वी आर डेमोन्स्ट्रेटिंग अ थेरापेटिक पेंटेटिंग क्रेटोप्लास्टी टू रिमूव अ सीरियसली इन्फेक्टेड कॉनिया हियर यू कैन सी अ प्रूवन फंगल कॉनेल इन्फेक्शन विथ पिगमेंटेड कॉनेल इन्फिल्ट्रेट्स विथ एक्सटेंसिव कॉनेल इन्वॉल्वमेंट एक्सटेंडिंग बियॉन्ड द लिम्बस दिस इन्फेक्शन हैज नॉट रिस्पॉन्डेड टू मैक्सिमम मेडिकल थेरेपी हैंस we have resorted to therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty as the next step our main goal here is to save the eye itself with improving vision as a secondary priority this surgery should be performed preferably under general anesthesia but can be performed safely under peripheral bar block make sure you wait for peripheral bar pressure to decrease before you apply the speculum speculum should be applied very carefully to avoid undue pressure over the globe which can increase intraocular pressure you can also apply flaringa ring to prevent scleral rim collapse examine the cornea for the extent of infiltrates areas of thinning any peripheral areas of thinning should also be noted here you can notice the extent of the infiltrate is beyond the limbus and hence i am doing a 360 degree conjectal peritoneal this is very important as it will also make the space for proper suture placement in the periphery here you might notice that though there is lot of bleeding i haven't used cautery to stop bleeding here that's because in this case the infection has spread beyond the edge of the cornea and if there is any possible remaining infection in the recipient sterile rim it will heal faster in the vascularized cornea than in the avascular cornea that's why i have avoided doing cautery in the peripheral area here can notice we have completed 360 degree conjectal peritoneal there is lot of bleeding at the periphery but as i said we have avoided doing cautery in this area size of the infected cornea is measured using calipers in both vertical and horizontal meridians and then accordingly size of the trephination of the uh, recipient should be carefully determined ideally if possible a 1 mm rim of healthy corneal tissue should also be removed to leave a stable non infected recipient bed however you can see in this case almost entire cornea including limbus is infected and hence we may not be able to define 1 mm margin of healthy tissue mark the trephine with marker and place it at the recipient bed to see and check again if the size of the trephination is proper and adequate here we are using an 11 mm trephine to cut the recipient bed you can notice we have marked the trephine with a gentian violet marker so we can clearly see the trephination edges this is especially important in this case because there is lot of bleeding near the limbus while using the trephine to cut hold the eye steady with the limbs forceps when you are rotating the trephine to cut the recipient area make sure you apply even pressure all around to ensure that the depth of the cut is consistent sometimes it is very important to avoid sudden entry into the anterior chamber especially when you are cutting through the sclera it is very challenging to maintain the even depth all around with only trephine that's why here i'm using a size 11 blade to carefully increase the depth of the cut all around here we have made entry into the anterior chamber at one point using size 11 blade and then viscoelastic is injected into the anterior chamber to form the anterior chamber so using right and left cutting scissors infected cornea is cut along the trephination edge 
This needs to be done carefully without applying any pressure on the glue. At this point, it is very crucial to avoid putting any pressure on the glue as it could lead to crystalline lens extrusion with or without vitreous prolapse. Keeping the lens intact is highly important during therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. If the lens comes out with vitreous prolapse, it can allow infections to spread posteriorly which worsens the prognosis in such situations. Giving preoperative mannitol also helps in preventing this situation. Be careful while cutting the cornea as well as try to look for any iris adhesions posteriorly and avoid cutting the iris while cutting the cornea. Once you have removed the entire cornea, at this stage it is very important to instruct your assistant not to put any pressure onto the drape or on the speculum which will lead to lens extrusion or vitreous prolapse. Also try to remove any exudates in the entry chamber, give a thorough wash to the entry chamber. Here you can see I am removing the exudates as well as the entry chamber is thoroughly washed, iris is thoroughly washed using a voriconazole solution. Viscoelastic is placed over the iris and the lens. We have prepared 12mm donor cornea. You can see it includes some part of scleral rim as well because it's being a larger graft. The graft uh, always includes some part of the uh, muck over the sclera. You can always clean it up and make sure that the scleral rim is positioned on the top so that it will be covered by the eyelid and it will give a better cosmetic appearance. Here comes the most important parts that is suturing of the graft. This is the first suture which is applied superiorly. You can see you have to hold the recipient ring firmly and then pass the suture from graft to the host. Always try to go at least 80% of the depth of the recipient. And uh, I, I usually pass both the sutures uh, in the same go. So you can see this is second sutures 180 degree away. And here once it is passed to the graft and then through the recipient rim, I just place the needle as it is just to support the graft. Don't take it out completely. Now here you can see because we have not removed the needle of the inferior uh, suture completely this is providing us a counter traction while we are uh, tying up the knot for the superior suture and it is avoiding the displacement of the graft superiorly and now you can take out the inferior needle and then tie the knot inferiorly this will make sure that graft is not displaced superiorly or inferiorly while putting the first two sutures Similarly, nasally the suture is passed by holding the recipient ring firmly. Now here you will notice that again I pass the temporal suture. The needle is passed to the graft, then through the recipient rim, and then the needle is placed like that without withdrawing it completely. This will again provide a counter traction suture while tightening the nasal suture. So here we are tightening the nasal suture. The counter traction from the needle which is placed partially will prevent the graft displacement. This is how we have completed four sutures. Now at this stage, assess the sutures for tightness, uh, equal length, equal depth and if you feel you can revise the suture at this stage but make sure that these four sutures are correctly placed with equal tightness because they are going to guide you for the next remaining sutures.
So here you can see I am revising the inferior suture and placing it rightly. And we have completed our first four sutures. You can inject viscoelastic to form the anti chamber after four sutures. And now these sutures, if are well positioned, they will form a square like this in the center. That indicates that your sutures are rightly placed and you can go ahead and place to your next sutures. Next, we will continue with additional sutures. It's important to ensure that each suture is placed evenly in terms of depth, length and tightness. Despite the challenge posed by bleeding, try for precision in your suturing. Now, as you have completed 8 sutures, you can again inject viscoelastic to form the anterior chamber. Avoid pushing saline again and again into the anterior chamber because it can push the saline through the zonules and place the lens anteriorly causing uh, anterior chamber to become shallow and pressure to rise. Now, as I am placing my last 2 sutures, you can see I have placed uh, inferior sutures pass the needle and then remaining superior suture is passed as well. Now here I am going to tie my inferior suture. But I am going to leave superior suture without tying and I am going to first bury my sutures. So here we are burying our suture knots. You can place viscoelastic onto the cornea so that uh, it acts as a lubricant uh, for the knots to bury and you can easily bury your knots. So carefully go on burying the knot. You can do it on the graft side as well as the recipient side. Even if uh, any suture breaks during burying process, just replace it immediately. Leaving last suture untied, you can use Simco to wash the anterior chamber. Usually there is some bleeding in the anterior chamber, you can always wash it. Wash the viscoelastic thoroughly. And once you are done with thorough anterior chamber washing, you can tie the last suture. This is very important because uh, here you are not uh, allowing the fluid to come out while suturing the last suture and the chamber is remaining maintained. And you can uh, uh, place it equally tight as the other sutures. Then at the end, you can bury the last suture and then inject some normal saline in the anterior chamber to form it. Check the graft root junction thoroughly for any leakage and then place bandage contact lens. And this is the end of the surgery. Two weeks after surgery, this patient was started on topical steroids once it was confirmed that there was no recurrence of the infection. This photograph is taken one year after the operation 
shows that the I achieving a visual acuity of 6.9 without correction. This case underscores the importance of dedicated treatment for such eyes, emphasizing that vision can indeed be restored. It serves as a reminder that there is always hope in every situation. Thank you.